Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bhartia and in this special edition of TFR Insights for KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, today we have with us once again Julian Fisher, founder and CEO of any 9 Julian, it's great to have you back on the show. It's great to be here again. Since we are talking Kubernetes and when it was Cloud Foundry Summit, we talked a lot about Kubernetes. It's KubeCon, so let's talk a lot about Cloud Foundry this time. So first of all, as we talked last time also, I just want to get your view on how do you see the relationship between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes? I was talking to Chip Childers from uh, uh, Cloud Foundry and he says that Cloud Foundry is more or less like the developer experience for Kubernetes. What are your thoughts? Well, that's definitely a very good point. Um... We've been talking about this interaction between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes for a while. So each time we meet, things have uh, evolved a little bit. Um, I think that uh, Cloud Foundry has a significant change happening um, within the Cloud Foundry stack itself, but also it has uh, induced a significant change within Kubernetes. Um, for example, I've uh, just earlier this day re uh, reviewed um, a proposal to introduce service bindings in uh, in Kubernetes, which is one of those um, topics that Kubernetes doesn't cover, but which uh, Cloud Foundry does. Um, the concept of uh, a data service and uh, how to create a, a, an application binding uh, to such a data service. So this is um, not nothing that all is already out, but it's um, you can see in that it's in a, a specification proposal, which means that people uh, take experience from Cloud Foundry and try to port it back uh, to Kubernetes. So I would say that if if you are a small organization and and you're trying to you know containerize your application. A single Kubernetes cluster is, is maybe good for you. That's that's fair. I thought I think nobody in that situation would uh, would try to download and install Cloud Foundry. However, if you are uh, a large a large or at least a mid-sized company or a large corporate, then you may want to have more governance of the applications and the way they are shipped to uh, Kubernetes. And uh, that's where Cloud Foundry becomes uh, important. So I think that uh, Chip Childers makes a very good point, saying that uh, the, the unique selling proposition of Cloud Foundry is about its user experience. So there are a lot of people, you know, who are evaluating, you know, to migrate to CF on Kubernetes. What is the right time when they should plan, prepare, or actually execute it? Well, the timing really depends on um, on several factors. The, the one is um, the maturity of the product. Um, and the second is um, the situation where, you, where a certain customer is currently in. So if, if you start from Greenfield and, um, and you have still time to build your, your internal platform offering, well, then maybe it's, um, it's worth having a look at Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes already. However, if you are shipping a, a global developer experience across multiple infrastructures, I would consider it a bit early uh, to um, introduce Kubernetes on Cloud Foundry, um, uh, Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes, I'm sorry, um, in production. So what are, the, what are the things that you can do to try out when the timing is right? Is, um, you can try to download um, Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes and um, you know, set up a staging environment um, and just go through the lifecycle events of such a platform, deploy applications and see whether it works out for you. So we are doing that constantly internally and uh, we get feedback that um, there are certain constraints. Um, so for example, earlier versions of uh, Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes, they had a, a limit of, let's say 2000 applications you can deploy there. And if your environment is bigger than that, which um, some of our larger clients do have bigger environments than that, well, then you still have to, to wait a bit. Um, and the second thing is if, if you are, happen to have one of those large environments based on uh, the classic Cloud Foundry stack, uh, the question is when it is, is it uh, the right time uh, to ship your existing applications and move them to the new stack? Well, obviously you have to build a new stack first and that stack needs to be reliable. So when you can use them to deploy Greenfield applications, it becomes more likely uh, to also deploy 
existing applications and move them to the new stack. However, uh, very often in these classic environments, it's not only about Cloud Foundry because Cloud Foundry is, let's say, the printer, but it doesn't come with ink. So uh, we're talking about data services again. And uh, real world applications, they do have dependencies uh, to those data services. So the question is not only about uh, how do you move your Cloud Foundry, but also how do you move um, your data service dependencies and your data service instances? Um, there were several ways on how you can do that. Uh, one way would be to um, take a Cloud Foundry um, on Kubernetes and integrate existing data service brokers, which may have, which may still run on, let's say, Bosch automation, for example, or you have to replace um, your data services with Kubernetes native um, uh, offerings, which may introduce some uh, differences so that even application changes may be necessary. And uh, what's the cost benefit of migrating is something that you have to then evaluate in the context of your specific uh, scenario. There are people who already have invested in Cloud Foundry and they have Cloud Foundry environments already and they are planning to start with Kubernetes. What, what is the best approach you would advise them? I think that's worth, at this point, it's worth pointing out what are the large differences. Um, as I said, running a Cloud Foundry environment with thousands of virtual machines is something that, that has been done over and over again. So this stack has been proven, it works at scale, and uh, also for experienced platform operators, it's daily business. They are they are trained to do that. It's, it's something that rarely produces outages. It's very reliable and stable. So if you change your stack um, inside out, then it is very likely that you'll introduce new obstacles, new problems, maybe immaturities, where, because the stack is still very new. So it's very important that uh, the stack has been uh, tested very thoroughly before uh, entering such a path of migration. So it's not only about feature parity, but it's also about maturity in both the technology, but also the operation team responsible for it. Um, and once these factors have been established, a migration will, well, it's it's pretty similar to migrating from one Cloud Foundry environment to another, which in large organizations uh, happens from time to time. For example, when they migrate from one infrastructure to another. So we've accompanied many of, my, of these migrations and um, they tend to work quite smoothly. Um, it's usually uh, the application developers are involved. They, are, they started to migrate their applications to uh, the second Cloud Foundry environment um, over an extended period of time. And then the actual migration happens by switching DNS and it's um, th that's usually just like the last the last switch, but the the ongoing testing and all the little obstacles you might encounter, uh, they have encountered during the migration phase that usually takes weeks or even months if the platform uh, happens to be very large. In addition to these, are uh, is there, have you seen any patterns of the challenges, hurdles, or pitfalls when people do make this move? Well, I can definitely tell um, because Cloud Foundry environments can be very large and um, they actually have to be large because they have a certain economy of scale. Um, let's say a certain minimum size um, below which it doesn't make sense to have a Cloud Foundry. In Kubernetes, that's a bit different. It comes with a lighter infrastructure footprint. And therefore, uh, I think a common mistake with Kubernetes, or let's say it's not a mistake, but a common habit with uh, Kubernetes is to have many more Kubernetes clusters than they have to than there have been Cloud Foundry environments, and now that's the point where you have to um, understand that each Kubernetes cluster has its own life cycle, and it needs to be maintained over this life cycle. You have to do updates, and um, and uh, whenever you have to perform an update, you have to update well, let's say a lot of Kubernetes clusters instead of just one single uh, Cloud Foundry environment. When, um, when this is guided, for example, by a single um, automation product, then this lifecycle management is, is feasible and it doesn't does not create large additional overhead. However, if especially larger organizations do not enforce a governance 
a policy on how to create Kubernetes clusters and how to uh, manage their life cycle, then it, it may happen that over time, so many different Kubernetes flavors are mixed. Well, some on the one infrastructure, some on the other, some provided by a third party vendor. And there will be many different disconnected Kubernetes clusters that cannot be uh, lifecycle managed with a single tool set. And this is when operational overhead is created that become a burden for such an organization. Um, so I would say that um, Kubernetes environments and Cloud Foundry environments, they may look alike, but in reality, they, they may also be used vastly different, creating different challenges. Yeah, I, I remember last time you say they are not same, they may look similar. Also in the beginning of the discussion, you mentioned uh, challenges with the data services. So uh, I also want to just quickly discuss uh, what are the common challenges when automating data services using Kubernetes? Well, most of the challenges uh, automating data services are in, in the core of data service automation. Um, the, the challenge is basically about that. Um, most of the data services are somehow owned by a vendor. And therefore, the vendor needs to find a business model, a viable business model to make profit from, from the actual data service. Now, the time is, I wouldn't say over, but it, it, it's not a popular model anymore to pay CPU-based licenses for a database. And, and nobody wants that anymore with uh, whatever um, all the, the problems going through procurement if, if the system changes and so on. So I think uh, people have different expectations now. So it became very popular to have database as a service products, even for data service vendors. And the, that means that each data service vendor ships its own version of its own automation. So if you are an organization and you have to operate, let's say, 100 different Kubernetes cluster, and in each Kubernetes cluster, you need um, five or six different data service automation products, like you have 100 times five deployments um, of, these, um, of these automation products. And each product is different. So that also complicates the uh, lifecycle management of these automation products. Um, there are certain standards within Kubernetes, and that's a very good thing. But still, it is uh, very likely that operational overhead and thus operational friction and thus waste happens. Um, that's the reason why we early on started to build our own data service automation so that one single automation product um, is used when automating a large number of data services. Because then each automation uh, for each data service uh, feels alike. And that is to the benefit of both the application developer who learns how to use Postgres once and sim similarly can use the same um, automation, for example, to provide Redis instances. When obviously there are some differences in configuration, but for example, the structure of the uh, of the, and the way you interact with the automation is the same. The way monitoring and uh, metrics and logs are treated are the same. And this is also true for the platform operator, for the one, the, the people who are responsible for um, operating Kubernetes. They also need uh, a tooling to keep these um, automation products up to date. For example, if a new version for your Postgres automation um, um, is released, you need to distribute it to all the Kubernetes cluster, uh, to Kubernetes clusters in your environment. Julian, thank you so much for taking time out from your schedule and talk about uh, Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. And as I said, you know, we talked a lot about Cloud Foundry. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I keep mixing these two, Kubernetes at the Cloud Foundry Summit. So let's talk more about Cloud Foundry at KubeCon. Once again, thank you. Thank you. And it was always, it's always a pleasure. So see you again soon.